Right, so hello and welcome back to Books and Things and welcome to my October wrap up. Today I'm going to be talking about all the books that I read during the month of October and as October was Victorian October or Victober, there will be quite a lot of Victorian books in this video. If you managed to miss a Victober, Victober was a month-long read-along hosted by me, by Anne from Beyond the Pages, Kate Howe and Lucy the Reader, in which basically we encourage people to read more Victorian literature during the month of October. And there were also five challenges which I'll be mentioning throughout this video for the books that I read for that particular challenge. Victober went fairly well. I did not get through my massive TBR as I expected that I wouldn't, and actually I didn't get through that much of my TBR because two of the books I read were not on my TBR and I only read nine books. I did also start two others which I'm hoping to finish in November as well. As well as my nine and two half Victorian books that I read, I did also read one non-Victorian book which I will start with. This I finished at the very beginning of October. I had been listening to it on audiobook for most of September and just didn't quite manage to finish it off before my September wrap-up. And that was The Silkworm by Robert Galbraith slash JK Rowling which is the second in the Cormorant Strike mystery detective series. I enjoyed this very much. I think I probably like the books for the characterization and the kind of descriptions of London and the way it explores London as a place slightly more than I do the actual mysteries but I did think the mystery in this The Silkworm was stronger than in the first one and I also like that the central mystery of it is all set in the publishing world because it follows what happens after a writer disappears. One of the reasons why I was hurrying to finish it off at the beginning of October was because I wanted to read the book before the TV adaptation went off iPlayer. I finished it and I looked on iPlayer and the second part was still up and the first part had gone off so I just missed it. I'm really keen to watch it because all the parts that took place at the publisher Roper Chard in the book were actually filmed at Hachette where I work and I think that'll be really really fun so uh, hopefully I will get to see that at some point in the future. Anyway leaving aside the non-Victorian stuff and let's get on to the Victorian literature that I read this month. The first book I read in October was this which is the Rebecca Writer by Amy Dillwyn. This fitted in to three challenges. One was my challenge to read a Victorian book by a Scottish, Irish or Welsh author because Amy Dillwyn is Welsh. It also fitted into Angie's challenge to read a underrated Victorian book and it also fitted into the general challenge of reading a book by a female author. This follows a young working class man in rural Wales and the events that take place in his life. It mainly focuses around his relationship with an upper class young lady who lives nearby and also what happens when he gets caught up in the Rebecca rioters which were riots that went on in Wales in the 19th century where men would dress up as women in order to disguise themselves and then riot to protest against high road tolls. There was something about this that reminded me about Lorna Doon and I can't exactly pin my finger on it because it's been so long since I read Lorna Doon but there was something about the style of this and the kind of brutality of some of the characters but also the kindness underneath that in places that I think reminded me of Lorna Doon and that I really really liked. I also just loved the particular setting and the way it explored these very small Welsh communities that are fairly cut off from other places in the country. Especially I found it really interesting talking about the kind of divide between the working and upper classes because the working classes all speak Welsh and the upper classes all speak English. All of the dialogue in this is written slightly oddly. The sentence structure is slightly strange and isn't how people would talk and I think it's because all of the characters are supposed to be speaking Welsh so she's not writing their words in a dialect because they're speaking in a different language but she's writing their words in English in a sentence structure that mirrors Welsh. I think that's what she's doing and if she is that's really really cool and despite that it's still really easy and enjoyable to read so I would highly highly recommend this. Very underrated and very very good. Next I read Drama and Muslim by George Moore. This fitted into two of the challenges. My challenge to read a Scottish, Irish or Welsh author and also Andrew's challenge to read an underrated Victorian book. This book was absolutely fascinating. I don't know that I loved it as much as some of the other books I read this month but I think I found it one of the most interesting books I read this month and it was very different and quite radical in many ways. I had to keep reminding myself when reading this that I was reading a book written in the Victorian period and not a historical fiction book about the Victorian period. But Drama in Muslin is set in Ireland in the 1880s and the basic plotline of it at first seems a little bit Jane Austen-esque. We have this mother trying to marry off her daughters and we get all of the kind of romantic relationships and that kind of thing. But at the same time the book deals really interestingly with the Land League and all of the political and social issues going on in Ireland in the 1880s so that it feels really like Jane Austen but every now and then a farmer will try and shoot a landlord through a window and there's a lot of violence and drama going on under the surface and there are also quite a lot of kind of taboo issues dealt with in here in a really interesting way. Alice and Olive's father is an artist who paints a lot of nudes and whenever they go into the studio he like turns all of the nude paintings to the wall but at one point he does have a portrait of two nude women one of whom is his daughter and one of whom is his wife. 
quite weird. Their mother has a very very close and very romantic friendship with a local lord who lives nearby and the implication is that they are having an affair and they've been having an affair for a really really long time. We also have a woman Cecilia who is Alice's best friend and who is clearly very deeply in love with Alice. In fact this book was at the time banned from the circulating libraries because it was deemed to be inappropriate because of its lesbian content. The main character Alice is an atheist and has sympathies with the Land League movement which none of the rest of the upper class characters around her have. And the book also deals interestingly with sex and sexuality in a way that most Victorian books don't. And there's a lot of premarital sex in this book. At one point in this book we hear two characters planning whose room they can go to that night in the hotel and this like that's something that happens a lot in like 1920s, 1930s novels but never come across something quite so open as that in a Victorian novel especially because that plot line plays out so differently to the way that most of those plot lines play out in Victorian literature. In general in Victorian literature when we're told about premarital sex it's because a young working class woman has been seduced by an upper class man and therefore gets pregnant and her life is like turned to ruin and everything kind of goes terribly wrong from there. That's a very common plot line in a Victorian book. What is not a very common plot line in a Victorian book is what happens here. I also love the way he criticises upper class Irish society especially because he doesn't necessarily do it very openly he just kind of exposes all of the awfulness of so many of these people. Although I didn't necessarily connect with all of the characters all of the time, I think this book was incredible and really really interesting. It's very underrated and I would highly recommend it, especially if you're interested in Ireland during the Victorian period. Next I read Emily Bronte's Wuthering Heights, which fits into both Kate's challenge to read a book with supernatural elements and also to the general challenge of reading a book by a female author. I've read this many times before. I think this might be my 10th reading. It might be my 9th, I'm not sure, but I think this is the book that I've read the most ever and it is in my like top five books ever that I've ever read. I love it very very dearly. If you don't know it follows two fairly wealthy families living on the Yorkshire Moors in the late 18th century and what happens when one day the Earnshaw family adopts a young boy called Heathcliff. No one really knows where he comes from. He's a bit strange, he's a bit angry and he forms a very close relationship with his foster sister Kathy. Everything kind of goes on from there. I think this is one of the best books ever written and I love it very very dearly and I also know it very well so it was weird reading it because I kind of knew like all of the words that were coming up. You know like one of those songs where you couldn't sing it from start to finish necessarily, you don't know the words well enough for that, but if you had the song on you could sing along with all of the words and get all the words right. That's how I am with Rothering Heights. I do love it though so much and every time I read it I discover and notice new things. The thing that impressed upon me this time, which I don't think I had noticed reading this when I was younger, is how young everyone is. All of the stuff that takes place in the middle of the novel. Kathy is 19 years old, Heathcliff is supposed to be the same age as her so he is like 19, 20 years old as well. 19. Like, they are so young. And in the second half of the book, young Catherine, I think, is not more than like 16, 17 by the end of it, and Hareton can't be more than 20. Like, they're all, they're all teenagers for like most of this book. It's so, I don't know how I had never fully clocked that before. Anyway, I love this book, like, beyond so many things. I think it is incredible and it was lovely to reread it and rediscover it and remember it and just get all of like the best phrases just ever. I love this book very very much so yes one of my favourite reads of the month though obviously it was a reread. And then my other favourite read of the month was The Odd Women by George Gissing which I absolutely adored. I love George Gissing and I think this might be my new favourite George Gissing. I have only read three so far to be fair but I think this probably beats The Netherworld and New Grub Street for me just because it's so feminist which was just lovely. The Odd Women fits into two challenges, again to read a underrated book which was Anne's challenges and also Lucy's challenge to read a Victorian book that was recommended to you because this came strongly recommended from my mum and a few booktubers as well and I just I thought it was so good and so interesting and just like there were so many points in this where I was so like utterly excited like I was reading this on my kindle and I was literally I was reading it while I was cooking I was like stirring the pot and like reading my kindle at the side because I didn't want to be not spending any time reading this book when I could be reading this book because it was so brilliant. So to explain what the odd women is about the phrase the odd women refers not to like the strange women but the odd women as in the left out women the women who aren't part of a pair. In the late Victorian period there were I think half a million more women than men in Britain and so there were a lot of women who were not married and therefore who had to find another way to live. The book partly follows two women, Rhoda and Mary, who run a typewriting school. They teach young educated women how to typewrite so that they can get jobs in offices. They talk about how for a long time the professions that 
educated women are limited to like basically you could just be a teacher but suddenly with the dawn of the typewriter there is this new possibility now women are taught how to type and offices might want female clerks and that completely changes the way that these women can get their livelihood we partly follow this typewriting school and the women there especially Rhoda Nunn and then we also follow three sisters that Rhoda knew when she was younger one of whom has been a teacher and is now struggling to find another place one of whom has been a companion and is now struggling to find a place and also possibly an alcoholic and the other of whom has been working in a shop but really wants to get married and it was just wonderfully feminist I might have to make like a full review of this so I could just like read out all of the passages that made me like heart to glow with oh guessing what an amazing guy brilliant brilliant to read a book that is from the Victorian period and that just completely dismantles all of Ruskin's ideas of separate spheres and is so critical of that I thought it was wonderful the exploration of marriage and the power balance within marriage the exploration of expectations that men and women have of each other in the Victorian period the only thing I think I would say about it is that I think the Rhoda Nunn plotline was in general stronger and better than the Monica Madden plotline and I found the ending of the Rhoda plotline like perfect and satisfying and exactly how I wanted that plotline to end but the ending of the Monica one I'm not sure if that was necessarily how I wanted it to end regardless I thought this book was incredible I would highly highly recommend it it's very underrated and very 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 brilliant again I might make a full review of this or a specific video talking about the feminism in it maybe I have like a slight idea of starting a series on this channel called feminist Victorians but we'll see we'll see whether or not I decide to actually do that I'm having thoughts about it let me know what you would think and if you would like to see that next I read Uncle Silas by Jerry Sheridan Le Fanu, which I was about to think didn't fit any challenges but no it does because Jerry Sheridan Le Fanu is Irish so this does fit my challenge of reading a book by a Scottish Irish or Welsh author Oh, and it's also only got 5,000 ratings on Goodreads, so it also fits the challenge of reading an underrated Victorian book. I think I, I'm trying to work out whether or not I liked it more than Carmela, but in general, I think maybe Carmela is the better idea, but Uncle Silas is slightly better executed, and certainly I felt a stronger connection with the characters in Uncle Silas. Uncle Silas follows a young woman called Maud. Maud has lived with her father all her life. They live in great seclusion. They don't really know very many people. And part of the reason why they don't see many people is because of a scandal to do with her uncle, Silas, who was accused many many years ago of murdering someone who was staying in his house eventually it was kind of agreed that it was probably suicide and people started to leave him alone but this kind of shadow that uncle silas was accused of murder kind of hangs over the whole of the family and then everything kind of goes on from there it is very 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 gothic and in places a bit of a horror novel and I just really enjoyed it. The ending kind of crept up on me and that I was kind of just really enjoying the writing and the characterization. And then suddenly I was listening to the audiobook and I realized they only had three hours to go. And then like the last three hours, like everything kicked off in like insane drama, which was really, really great. And I really enjoyed. I thought Maud was a really great and interesting narrator and character because at times she fits into this kind of stereotype of the gothic passive victim. She describes herself as being very nervous and certainly for a lot of the book she is, but you kind of can also understand why for the events that take place in this book and also there are moments of real like fortitude and strength which I thought made her a really really believable and interesting character and much more sort of three-dimensional than I thought at the beginning she was going to be. The audiobook I listened to was from Audible and was narrated by BJ Harrison and if you are going to listen to this book on audiobook I wouldn't necessarily listen to this one. The narrator did a very good job of capturing the atmosphere and the general sense of fear but it was slightly weird and slightly off-putting at first to have a book that is narrated by a young English woman read by an American man and I just found it took me a bit longer to get into the story and to connect with Maud having a male narrator reading a female part when the reader would do Maud's dialogue he would put on a sort of English female voice but he wouldn't for her narration even though it's first person and she's always speaking which I just found slightly odd to begin with I got into it it was fine I really enjoyed the book and then I read The Mill on the Floss by George Eliot which I have to say I hated I gave it two stars but even then I feel like maybe it should be one it is one of my least favorite Victorian books I've ever read and I've decided that I'm done with George Eliot I'm not going to read any more George Eliot we don't get along I don't like her writing I'm done with her I have made a full video about this but specifically to talk about The Mill on the Floss Oh, I just, I really, really hated it. Um, I really hated it. I am sorry, Jen, from insert literary pun here. I know it is your favourite book, but I, I just, I couldn't, I couldn't, I didn't like it. I think I would have enjoyed it more if I hadn't seen a film adaptation of it several years ago, but because I had seen the film adaptation and I knew the plot and I knew the ending, that did partly ruin the enjoyment of the rest of the book for me because I hate the ending of this book so much. It follows a girl called Maggie over her childhood and her adult life, particularly focusing on the relationship she has with her brother, who 
she is deeply, deeply attached to and is a horrible person who doesn't really like her very much. Her father owns a mill and the book follows partly their sort of financial ruin and their change in position. I found the pacing really, really weird. Tom and Maggie are children for more than half the book and that section really, really dragged. I enjoyed the second half much more and I was getting to like the book until like the last 2% on my Kindle when the ending, which I think is a terrible, terrible cop out of an ending, was just ruined the rest of the book entirely for me and all the enjoyment I had had in the second half just died. Part of the reason why I dislike this book so much is the relationship between Maggie and Tom. Tom is just a horrible man and you can't understand how Maggie can love him. You could understand, I think, how she could love him because he is her brother but also kind of hate him a bit. But we never really get that explored. She just kind of loves him blindly for most of it. There's like one moment where she says that she doesn't think they'd be able to live together because they wouldn't get on well. And that's like it. There is no proper exploration for me of their relationship to each other and of the way Maggie feels for him, despite the fact that this is like the central part of the book. The Mill and the Floss was absolutely not for me. I found it boring. I like really hurried through the second half because I just wanted to finish it and get it over with. I find George Eliot's writing so dry. The pacing was really, really weird. I didn't like Maggie or Tom or like any of the characters apart from maybe Lucy, but we don't get to find out much about her. And I just found the ending so abominably terrible that I just I just I didn't like it I didn't like it at all it is partly inspired by Elizabeth Gaskell's The Modern Cottage and I think The Modern Cottage is so superior as a novel like so 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 much better that I just I am very angry with The Mill and the Floss and I'm angry with George Eliot still and I finished it like 10 days ago now however saying that while I know it is not for me that doesn't necessarily mean you won't like it and I would direct you to um, my Victober collaborative video that I made last week with several other booktubers recommending Victorian books. I will link that down below and I will try and link specifically the timing of Jen from Insert Literary Pun here talking about The Mill and the Floss and I will also link down below her um, review of it that she did a while back in talking about her favourite books because she loves The Mill and the Floss and after I had watched her clip and she talks about how The Mill and the Floss is about people loving other people in ways that that other person can never really understand and how there are so many incidences of this throughout the book. I kind of got that and I can kind of see that and I can see that there is something really interesting that George Eliot is doing here that I just don't get because I dislike her writing and her characters and her pacing so much but I do think it's worth watching Jen's video because although I really didn't like The Mill and the Floss that doesn't necessarily mean you won't. I think if you like George Eliot you might like it because part of my issue is just that I don't like her writing so unless she has like a really good plot and really good characters I won't enjoy her books. So yes, I'm I'm done with George Eliot, but I will I will rant about that another time. I then read Miss Marjorie Banks by Margaret Oliphant. Miss Marjorie Banks, or possibly Miss March Banks. I think it's supposed to be Miss March Banks, but it's written Marjorie Banks, so I'm gonna keep saying that. This book fits into several challenges. Andrew's challenge to read a lesser well-known Victorian book, my challenge to read a book by a Scottish, Irish or Welsh author and also the general challenge to read a book by a female author. And this is one of the books in the Carlingford Chronicles which follow various characters within the same town. I really, really enjoyed this. I think this is one of my favourite Margaret Oliphant things I've read so far. I don't think it quite beats her novella Queen Eleanor and Fair Rosamond, which I absolutely loved, but in terms of the rest of the Carlingford Chronicles, this is probably my favourite out of the four that I've read. It follows a young woman called Lucilla Marjorie Banks and her relationships and her position within society. She is the doctor's daughter. She gets home from school at 19 and decides that she is going to be a comfort to her papa and also to make herself the kind of social centre of Carlingford in a way. She has these evening parties on Thursdays where she invites everyone to come and see her and she is very very respectable and very widely liked. The book takes place over quite a long period of time. There is a gap of about 10 years in the middle which I wasn't really expecting and which I found a little bit odd but despite that I really really enjoyed the book and I liked how interesting Lucilla Marjorie Banks is as a character. She reminded me in a little way of Emma Woodhouse but a kind of Emma Woodhouse who doesn't really have a Mr Knightley and what that kind of means for her character. She means really well but she also meddles possibly sometimes slightly too much in other people's lives and sometimes her meddling means that she ends up matchmaking away all of the people who were slightly interested in her with other people and kind of what that means. I love the ending. It was the ending I was kind of expecting and hoping would happen and I really enjoyed it. I thought it was a lovely, enjoyable book. And I did finish two other books this month, neither of which were on my TBR. One was The Two Destinies by Wilkie Collins. Now, this wasn't on my TBR, but No Name by Wilkie Collins was. And not necessarily because I desperately wanted to read No Name, just because I wanted to read something else by Wilkie Collins. And then I finished Uncle Silas on audiobook halfway through the month and was looking for another Victorian audiobook and found an audiobook of The Two Destinies, which I thought would be interesting because I wanted to read another Wilkie Collins, I didn't know much about it. This was a weird one and I can't decide whether I liked it or not. I think I liked most of it until the ending, the last like 
hour or even like half an hour of the audiobook where things got weird. The Two Destinies, while definitely my least favourite Wilkie Collins book that I've read so far, is quite an interesting book. It fits into two of the challenges for Victober. One to read a lesser well known Victorian book. I think this has like under 200 ratings on Goodreads, so I don't really understand why there's an audiobook of it, but hey. And also the challenge to read a book with supernatural elements because this book does have supernatural elements. It is a gothic novel to a certain extent, though more I would say it is like a kind of supernatural or spiritual novel, perhaps. It is a story within a story. It is a frame narrative. And we learn about this couple, these two people who knew each other when they were little children, when the boy was 13 and the girl was 10 and were desperately and passionately attached to each other. They were best friends, they were going to get married when they were older. And then because he was of a much higher class than her, they were separated by their parents and apart from many, many years. And the book basically follows the story of how they find each other again at various points in their life, including like supernatural appearances of each other to each other. There were some things about this that I really, really enjoyed. And for the most part until the end, I was quite liking it. But although I enjoyed the bulk of this audiobook a lot, and I loved Wilkie Collins's writing, the very end of it and how weird that was and the way the characters react to what's going on at the end, made me dislike both of them so much. I just completely not understand them that I'm really confused. Please let me know if you have read The Two Destinies and if you found the ending quite as weird as I did. But regardless, an interesting one. Then the final book that I finished during October was this, which is Ghostly Tales, Fine Chilling Stories of the Victorian Age. This is a collection of gothic and supernatural short stories from the Victorian period, which I picked up this month and really, really enjoyed. So this again fits into Kate's challenge of reading a supernatural book. This wasn't on my TBR, partly because I only discovered it and bought it earlier this month. I went on a booktuber meetup in the middle of October and we were in Dawn Books and Jen Campbell was looking at this, said, it's Victorian, it's one for you, and handed it to me. So it has beautiful end papers. It has beautiful, beautiful illustrations and seven great stories, which are a Whistle and I'll Come to You My Lad by M.R. James, The Old Nurse's Story by Elizabeth Gaskell, The Signalman by Charles Dickens, The Body Snatcher by Robert Louis Stevenson, The Captain of the Pole Star by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, The Phantom Coach by Amelia B. Edwards, and The Screaming Skull by F. Marion Crawford. I really enjoyed these. I love a Victorian ghost story, mostly because they don't tend to be scary, they just tend to be really sad, and that's like my preference in ghost story. I think my favourite one was possibly The Captain of the Pole Star by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, although I also do really love The Old Nurse's Tale by Elizabeth Gaskell. And finally, the two books I started in October but did not finish are two non-fiction Victorian books. The first was The Uncommercial Traveller by Charles Dickens. I'm probably about a third of the way through this and I haven't read it for about two weeks. I am still really enjoying it. I'm hoping to finish it in the month of November for non-fiction November. It is a series of kind of journalistic writings from Charles Dickens talking about his explorations of various places in Britain and abroad. And I have been really, really enjoying it so far, but just need to get myself back into it and read some more of Dickens' travels. I'm never going to love his non-fiction as much as his novels but I am really enjoying it and it's nice to hear a few more details about some different places in Victorian Britain. And then my other non-fiction that I've started and am again probably between a quarter and a third of the way through is The Life of Charlotte Bronte by Elizabeth Gaskell which I am really really enjoying again but just haven't managed to get more through but I am really really enjoying The Life of Charlotte Bronte so far. It's lovely to read more about Charlotte Bronte's life and to discover more about her and her siblings especially because it's written by Elizabeth Gaskell who was her friend. So I'm sure I'm gonna love this, but yeah, I just need to get on to the end and again finish it for non-fiction November. So that is my Victober wrap up. Those are all the books that I read this month. It was a pretty good month. I feel like I didn't get as much read as I got read in Victober last year, but I also feel like I read quite a few shorter things in Victober last year. And I did get through quite a lot of like fairly decently sized books this month. And I did have a lot of really good reading experiences, especially of The Odd Women, which I absolutely adored and is a real new favorite for me. It was wonderful to reread Wuthering Heights and Drama and Muslim and the Rebecca Wright were great as well and I think part of the reason why I didn't get quite as much read as I was hoping to was because I instead partly focused on a, making a lot of videos this month and posted like three videos a week which was quite a lot and was quite exhausting um, and which was really fun and I had so many ideas for Victoria videos that I wanted to do so I'm glad I did all of them but I think that's partly why I didn't get quite as much read as I could have done if I had made a few less videos but hopefully you all enjoyed the videos um, and if you missed any of them I have made a playlist of like my Victoria 2017 with all of the videos I made this month about Victorian literature so I will link that down below as well if you would like to go and have a look at anything you have missed. So that is it for Victober 2017. I had a great time. I hope you had a great time too if you were participating. If you were participating please let me know down in the comments and link me your wrap-ups and tell me what your favourite Victorian book was that you read this month. It was fun. I'm already looking forward to next year and although I will be reading Victorian literature throughout the year I will probably already start planning my like TBR for Victober 2018 because you know 
I do really enjoy a month full of Victorian goodness. So thank you very much for watching and thank you so much for taking part in Victober. If you have done so, I thought it was great fun and yes, the Victorians are amazing. So thank you very much for watching and I'll be back very soon with another bookish video.